Hi, my name is Dusan Stoinov and I'm a professor of psychology at Belgrade, Serbia, and I'm also president of Serbian Constructivist Association. The lecture I am giving today is uh, concerned with uh, different and new forms of support psychologists can offer to managers in order to facilitate their living in a very fast pace of changing which is happening throughout the world. We have been trying to help people for a long time. So uh, psychology uh, may be a science with a short history, but it surely has a very long past. Uh, the first uh, facilitator was a shaman in a tribe. You had to know how to dance, you had to be friendly with the chief, be, and you, you had to be very convincing in those rituals. Then after a couple of centuries, we had to spread under the wings of accredited institution. So we went to churches and we were doing all those confessions. So we realized that we can make a lot of money on that. And the next step was commercialization. So it was under Anton Mesmer in Vienna who put the hypnosis on the scene. Psychoanalysis capitalized it all. And very soon, 20th century became the century of psychotherapy. But centuries change, people change, world change, habits change, because the needs are being changed. So we had to ask some new questions about that. Reasons for this psychological support were described in a prophetic article written by George Kelly, father of constructivist psychology, which was called Ontological Acceleration. With, with this idea of ontological acceleration, he was trying to say, we cannot expect our society and our social institutions to be the same. Implications of ontological acceleration of society they are actually very much connected to what is happening to the state. One of the main implications of this is the loss of the staple state. Fast capitalism, volatile economy, many people unemployed, many jobs being changed, many professions disappearing, many skillful people becoming obsolete. And professional survival calls for a highly accelerated tempo of intensive changing in your skills, in your knowledge, which is called lifelong learning. <laughs> anyway, learning becomes a technology for shaping human cells into a more desired condition. And what is more desirable, uh, desirable and desired today than to be entrepreneurial, flexible and innovative? So there are a lot of anxieties connected with the change. Unfortunately, those changes are not simple because they frequently resemble the state of these comprehensive societal transitions like the ones we had in Eastern Europe. The idea was how to support managers in holding up their professional competencies with relevant psychological knowledge and skills. So we cannot contribute to your knowledge of economy, we cannot contribute to your knowledge of finances, but we thought, okay, styles in leadership, the way you manage people, the way you build your teams, we can help you enhance your creativity, we can help you to become more flexible and mobile, and perhaps do something about those little quarrels happening in your department. And all of a sudden, a lot of practices of psychological support were there on the market. But the practice with the largest integrative potential and the most flexible adaptation capability towards needs of manager by and large, seems to be coaching. So coaching is becoming more and more present form of psychological support. 
But in order to help people coach, in order to facilitate the change, psychology had to be transformed. And my aim and my task in this lecture is to try to show you what are the directions of this turn in psychology. Positivity, relationalism, transformativity, fragmentation and performativity. Study of dysfunctional, incapable and disordered people brings forth psychology of disorder. If we want to reach our potentials, psychology has to study high achievers, capable and functional persons. I think it was Abraham Maslow who once said, if you want to study disordered people, you get disordered psychology. <laughs> so positive psychology went to a different direction and I think it has chosen, it has chosen a better way. It searches for potentials and capacities. It identifies behaviors that are functional and that can still be upgraded. It aims at positive indicators like happiness and welfare by assessing strengths, by balancing immediate personal needs and developing more resilient ecological immune system. We are deeply emerged in the network of relationships. And only when we are ostracized or being lost in the jungle, then we realize how important our relationships are and how much we depend upon other people. So community and sociality are basic principle of networking. <coughs> and our psyche is not a question of mental interior, but a state of indistribution in between people. We had to displace our mentality from a very narrow space between the ears a much wider and comfortable space between people. Next principle is transformativity. Learning needs to change. If you want to change, you have to learn. And together, learning and change lead to experience. But we also have to transform ourselves. And there was this, I think, very strong stereotype in, in the century of psychotherapy. With learning, you change bits and pieces of your behavior. You change your competencies, you change your peripheral issues, but you don't change your personality, your core, your identity, yourself. But even if we can change to the worse, this is a good thing because it tells us that we can change to the better. Through time, psychology had to transform itself as well. The most stable and consistent and universal process, process in psychology is change. And change is the basic principle of human development, which leads us to fragmentation, which is something new. So accelerated globalization has brought for more choices person has to make than ever before. And one of the ways to get out of this problem is to realize that we are far more fragmented than we actually believed before. So also, although we are a whole, our personality is made of very many sub-personalities which are reasonably fragmented from each other. But this doesn't mean that we are being disordered, that we are having multiple personality disorder. It just says that we have, whatever you call them, ego states, roles, community of cells, I positions, protean identities, we have more than one functioning sets in our personality. So the self in traditional psychology, which was seen as contained in itself, 
separated like this uh, beautiful house somewhere in the north of England, stable like those pillars in uh, St. Marco Square, individual like Mary Poppins, and private. So we have to invent a new theory about self. Self is emergent, self is contextual. You cannot have a self if you don't use language. It's discursive. It is a story. It is not the essence in, inside. It is multiple, even if we are not having a multiple disorder. It is relational and it is mutual. Much more social than we believed before. Performativity, the last of big turns we had to make in psychology in order to suit the needs of normal people being affected with this global societal change. Performance is a property of the arts, not of science. Scientists do not perform. A scientist is a man who bravely goes to the unknown and carves the truth in stone. But is it so? Are we performing when we do science? I think yes. So performative social science is defined as the use of different forms of artistic performance in the execution of science. So performativity is based on something very simple, but it has far-reaching consequences. It is not only about scientists, it is actually telling us that insight is not enough. So we can look at people as performers of life scenarios. We can uh, say that change equals to activity, not the insight. And we have to talk about creative innovations. So we can look at change as performance. Change is not happening only as effect of insight. It is not spontaneous reaction to our decision of change. It is the product of hard labor of performing, performative efforts. It is possible, but it don't come easy. It is hard work. So this is the new role for psychology. How to help managers to prevent burnout, to be protected from stress, and make a proper balance between work and family life. And there are some areas of psychological support we were able to think so far. You see, managers actually are ordinary people. They're not superhumans, they're not super beings. There is nothing ever so special about them. Our research says that they have the same fears and threats and problems as other people who are not managers. Their professions are a little bit more demanding because sometimes their decisions uh, have far more reaching consequences for the work of all other employees as well as the whole organization. So although uh, we are aware of hierarchical order in organizations, usually we are not aware that our mental processes are also organized in the same hierarchical way. And we can say that there are far-reaching consequences of trivialities, and that our behavior should be concerned with those little trivial things, as much as it is already concerned with big issues big deals. So whatever we do, we do because we think it is the better alternative to what we think it is the worse alternative. We choose to do what we do, even if we commit suicide. Simply as that. Sometimes it's good to learn that others may not share our view on the issue. Psychology is trying to help us realize that the tension which arises from this is inevitable, but it is our responsibility to face it and try to change it to the better. Thank you. Thank you.